shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5「Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Sunday, the 16th of September 2018, a nice sunny and warm day over here in Belgium and I think not very much different over there in Germany where Brother Michael is again, is again with us today as he was uh, shamefully absent yesterday. We missed him thoroughly, that's why he came back today. Wonderful. And of course also I have my brother Brett connected with me because we are gathered here together to do the 12th reading of the subject that Peter never was in Rome. Simon Peter meets the competition. Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. We are going to continue to read in the book from Ernest L. Martin today and uh, we will see some very awkward and pagan stuff in that book. But as I said already yesterday, this is the reason why we are going to read this whole book of Ernest L. Martin, even though we have had this 24 pages introduction on the same subject that was very much based on the Bible, as is Ernest L. Martin's book. But Ernest L. Martin also puts us through a um, quote-unquote time travel through the history in his book, and that's going to be very interesting, I can assure you, to follow this today. But... Uh, I have to shut up for a second and invite my two guests here uh, who are connected with me on Skype on the call. And first I want to refer to Michael who is uh, quite close over there in Germany. How are you doing brother Michael and very much welcome to the broadcast today. Yes, hi there. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I was missing you both too yesterday. <laughs> But, uh, of course, you were so nice to hand over the uh, audio files so that I can keep up with the content of this lecture. And I'm very much pleased that I can be here today. And Brad, welcome to the broadcast, too. Thank you, Jörg. Yes, all the way from Romerica over here in the central part of the continent here, near the Mississippi near the twin cities of Romerica <laughs> in northern uh, central Romerica, yes. Well said. Yeah, we were uh, fearing a yeah. little bit for you because you lost your internet connection a few hours ago, Oh, right? yeah, so. yeah. That's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, I guess my router bit the dust on the Ethernet ports. I don't usually use wireless. I use Ethernet. And that way you keep the the brain waves, you know, a little a little uh, clear. Um, I know that there are a lot of people that say, "Oh, you're a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist," since you think those waves affect your brain. But I'm sorry, they do. And they do. I can, yeah, they do. And I can prove that because, well, I've I've sensed it for myself. Um, there are specific frequencies that will resonate in your uh, awareness let's just put it that way um, but uh, you can't pick up on all these frequencies unless you have recognized them and I have recognized them and I don't like them and I try and do what I can to keep that at a minimum and since I don't live in the city I'm blessed with <laughs> not many of them let's put it that way there's very few and it's kind of a weak signal so uh, no problems 
no problem. Yeah, it's a little bit different over here. I mean, this is why I switch off my router when I go to sleep at night because uh, my internet and my quote unquote desk is in my live in my bedroom. And then I switch off my router because that also is working for wireless connection. But I live in an apartment building where there are three other or four other routers in the neighborhood. And of course, I get all their radiation. But I feel quite a difference in my sleep since I turn off my own router. Oh, I, yeah. I just pull the plug at night. And right. I really feel a difference with that, you know. So anybody oh, who yeah. says you're just a tinfoil hat, I say, well... Try it and you will see the difference. And uh, also, I will not put my cell phone. I put my cell phone next to my head, but it is switched off, completely off. It just starts the next morning with the alarm clock, you know. Oh, cool. Yep. And uh, mm -hmm. then the then the then the cell phone goes up, and then it asks, uh, "You want to switch on the cell phone? Do you want to turn on the cell phone after the after the alarm clock?" And then I say yes, and then it starts the telephone, and everything is all right. So I don't wow, have that radiation really next cool. to my head either, and I don't need yes. another kind of clock or whatever in my in my bedroom. You know, I think there are a few <coughs> advantages in Europe. Um, there's more demand for these types of products, and in America we are just going with the flow. You know, these people just uh, they buy the uh, wireless telephones, no, we the wireless are, internet, Brett, the wireless this, the wireless that. We are that. radiated here like rats. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, there's no difference between Europe and the United States of America. You can you, know, you you can be sure about that. You know, I have a <clears throat> a friend of mine who is quote unquote a computer expert, the one who installed my computer that I have right now here. Yeah, he told me things about wireless connections all over here in Belgium. Uh, he said you wouldn't believe it doesn't matter anyhow if you switch off your router or not at night. And I said, well, I sleep better. And he thinks uh, then he says, well, then that's just in your head. I said, maybe that's true, but uh, at least in my head, then I sleep well, you know. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if so, it makes you feel better, you just do it. If it makes me feel better, I just do that, you know. Yeah, yeah that's, me too. That's the point. But uh, I can tell you, we are grilled over here in Europe as much as you are in the United States of America. With all these wireless connections, G4, G5, Harp, and all these things all around in the world, I mean... It's it's here no better than at uh, than at your place probably you you probably even have a little bit less because you really live far from uh, uh, really in the outskirts of the city. Uh, that's I, true. I live in that's Belgium. True. I live in yep. Belgium, which is such a little country, and that has a population of eleven million people. Yes. So I understand the density. It's a lot is, bigger. Yeah, the density is quite high. It is high, a lot course. bigger. Oh, I know, and I'm sure the traffic reflects that. You've told me that. Mm. And uh, I, I guess that's something you have to experience in order to know it, uh, because the traffic we get here is probably just peanuts compared to over there, even in the worst scenario. Yeah, you know. the traffic over here in Belgium is kind of like uh, living in L.A. and rush hour 24-7, uh, uh. more or less. That's a little bit yeah. exaggerated, but um, that gives you an idea what it is all about. But anyway, yeah, right. let's go to the reading, to the book of Ernest L. Martin. I really want to go into that because I love this study that we are doing here. I'm glad that our brother Michael is uh, accompanying us today again. And so we will read in the next part of this book that is called Petras in Pagan World. And we are still continuing on the subject, Pagan Gods Called Peters. Yeah? So I have the picture here of Simon Peter, the Apostle, to the left, and Peter Magus, or uh, Simon Magus, on the right, dressed in black. I will keep that picture for a moment. And we are speaking about Petrus in pagan world. Notice some references to these sacred Petras found throughout the pagan world. At the tempi of, uh, temple of Delphi in Greece, the chief object in the ritual was the Petra, Pausanius, in, uh, as we can read in Pausanius book number 10. At the Acropolis in Athens, Euripides tells us the, niece, uh, the niches where, uh, which held the idols were called Petrae. It is well known that even the sacred book which was used in the celebration of the Illusion and Mysteries was entitled, quote, Book Petroma, unquote. Peter Roma, Peter's book. And you can confirm that in Potter's Antiquities, 
volume 1, page 356. Remember that the pagan temples were also called after the Peters. The temple at Elis in Greece was called Petron. Pytho at Delphi was called Petraessa. The oracle temple dedicated to Apollo in Asia Minor was called Patara, and the oracle there was called Paterias. Ios means person, who or one. And we can read that in Lampereus Classical Dictionary. Also, Petrae, an ancient town where Diana had a temple. Now I prepared a picture of Diana. You can see here, this is the goddess Diana with a hundred breasts, a real fertility goddess of the pagans. An ancient town where Diana had a temple and the oracle in Achaia was called Petra. We can read that in John's Proper Names of the Old Testament, page 296. Examples are just too numerous to mention, but this should be enough to show that the name Peter or any of its variants figured very high in every phase of pagan worship. Sun worship, let me uh, add here. S-U-N, sun worship. These Peter stones and temples were found all over the ancient world. As Brian says in his book, quote, there is in the history of every oracular temple some legend about a stone, some reference to the word Petra. Unquote. Now we come to the origin of ancient Peter worship. Peter worship can be traced directly back to Mesopotamia. It was there that idolatry had its beginning. There is where the Tower of Babel was erected. It is no wonder that in Mesopotamia we find the first mention of a Peter temple in Numbers 23. Now let's go to the uh, let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the book of Numbers and the chapter 23. And it says here in the book um, 22, 4-5. So that must be then chapter 22, right? Not 24. What is that here? 4 to 5, let's see here. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And in 22, what does it say? I don't know. This seems to be a wrong reference. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor and Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. So I don't know which reference is correct in Numbers 23, 22, 4, 5. We just read it, that the false prophet Balaam was called to prophesy against Israel. Further, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 4, so let's go there. Deuteronomy, that's the fifth book of Moses. Uh, what is it, 23, 4, it says? 23, verse 4. It says, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against the, the Balaam, the son of Beor and Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. You see, Pethor is kind of a Peter, right? As it says here, we read that this Balaam had been called from Pethor of Mesopotamia. That is, from the Peter of Mesopotamia. So, the connection that I make here, gut feeling wise, is the correct one. The Bible uses this word to make the same reference to the Peter of Mesopotamia, a pagan god. Okay, so, this Pethor, or Peter, either spelling is correct, but probably pronounced exactly the same, this Peter was the place of an oracle temple. 
In the Dictionary of Proper Names of the Old Testament, edited by A. Jones, we find that Balaam's Peter was the sacred high place, quote, where there was an oracular temple, and hence called Peter or Petora, which meant place of interpretation, or oracular temple. Here was, no doubt, a college of priests of whom Balaam had been appointed chief Petora or Peter. Unquote. Yes, Balaam was the chief Peter of the Petor Peter Temple if of Mesopotamia. It was customary for each pagan country to have a chief oracle or a chief temple. The Pithor or Peter in Greece was Delphi, in Egypt it was Ammon, in Asia Minor it was Lycia, and later Pergamos. Professor Jones tells about the other Pithors throughout the world, and we are not speaking of Indiana Jones. Notice, quote, these high places were scattered about in many parts. There was a city of interpretation in Achaia, called Petrai, and another in Lycia, called Petara, where Apollo had an oracle. Pithor was in after times celebrated for the worship of Eilat. Unquote. Now, Balaam is the chief Peter, or the chief god. And what's another name for Balaam? Probably Baal, and that leads us, I guess, to Nimrod, which leads us to the source of all pagan religions. <sighs> Babylon, huh? Mm -hmm. But Balaam came from Pithor on the Euphrates, the oracle of Mesopotamia. He was no less than the chief Petora, as Jones mentions, of the very home of idolatry and false religion. The very meaning of the name Balaam shows he considered himself as sitting in the very chair of Nimrod, the beginner of the mystery religions. The name Balaam means in Semitic tongues, conqueror of the people. This was the exact proper name the Greeks used to designate to Nimrod. They called him Nikolaus, which also meant conqueror of the people. And Nikolaus is what we call in German uh, uh, Santa Claus, you know, uh, the Christmas wow. guy. Satan Claus. <laughs> yeah, Satan Claus. Conqueror of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And especially conqueror of the hearts of children, right? Uh. Now in the New Testament we read of people following the doctrines of Nicolaus or Nimrod. They were called Nicolaitans. Now this is a little bit different writing here, but Nicolaitans is the way that you pronounce this. Um... We can read of that, of course, in the book of uh, Revelation and chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken. Thanks, Jörg, yes. Uh, uh, it's because Jesus Christ said, uh, this, I have, uh, this you have, uh, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, as I also hate the, 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 the work of the Nicolaitans. Uh, because Jesus Christ there condemns the Nicolaitans' works, and not the Nicolaitans themselves. He doesn't hate the people, he hates the works they are doing. Very important part in the Bible, because some people interpret that the way, the, oh, Jesus, who says we love our enemies, he says he, lo he hates those people. No, he doesn't hate them. You have to read this uh, verse correctly in, uh, I think it is Revelation chapter 3. Now, McClintock and Strong's Encyclopedia, speaking of them, says, quote, The sect of the Nicolaitans is described as following the doctrine or teaching of Balaam, and it appears not improbable that this name is employed symbolically, as Nicolaus is equivalent in meaning to Balaam. Yes, the two names, Nicolaus and Balaam, are exactly the same in meaning. They both point to Nimrod. Well, let's just put a picture of Nimrod in here. Then we have that already of our backs. Got so many pictures of Nimrod. 
this is one that I very often use. Uh, it has a very bad resolution, so I'm going to use another one. Maybe you know this one. No. Uh, Nimrod and Semiramis. Uh, no. Where's a good one? Oh, l let's take this one with all the other names for Nimrod. That's interesting to study next to my reading here. Okay. <laughs> yes, the two names Nicolaus and Balaam are exactly the same in meaning. They both point to Nimrod, the originator of paganism, the originator of S-U-N, sun worship. We also find that when Simon Magus, alias or also known as Simon Peter, quote-unquote Christianized the religion of Nimrod. Now, John the Apostle plainly labels his followers Nicolaitans and followers of Balaam. All of the heresies mentioned in the seven churches are of one system, the system of Nimrod under the leadership of Simon Magus. Or, as I tried to tell you, we can call it the Simonian system. Now, let's just go to that one verse in uh, Revelation, chapter three, <coughs> where we can reach about uh, where we can read about Jesus Christ. I think uh, is it not Revelation three? Uh, May no, I interrupt a second? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm viewing the uh, monitor, the, the screen of red at the moment, but not your screen. Oh. I don't know if it's, cor if it's recorded correctly, this uh, video. Oh yeah, it is. Yerk's got the recorder going. Yeah, I got um, the recorder going, but not I my share screen. You share your screen, Brett, that's right. You should not do that. So you can follow my screen. Oh, yeah, shoot, sorry. That was me, I don't know why. Technical difficulties this morning. Yeah, now it's my screen, right? Yes. Now we have this. I mean, this doesn't change my recording that I did, but it just changes what you and Michael can see. Yeah, I just want to let you know. Okay, yeah, that's, that's Yeah, nice. I wasn't sure why that was happening. Uh, uh, I had no idea, you know, what was going on here. So it's Revelation chapter 2, not Revelation chapter 3. It says here, and you know the words of Jesus Christ are put in red. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ told to John the Revelator. And Jesus Christ says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, uh, as I said, the works, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What does Jesus Christ hate? The deeds of the Nicolaitans, not the Nicolaitans themselves. That yeah, is a he very was speaking. Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, he he was speaking about which I also hate and not whom I also hate. Right, but there are many people who do not even make that distinction, mm -hmm. uh, Michael. <laughs> yeah, good point. You're correct. Mm -hmm. I have had a few um, persons in in the past commenting on my channel that Jesus Christ hates the Nicolaitans. I said, no, you have to read this correctly. And you know what's interesting about this? While we're at this, you say, it says, which I also hate, so that refers to the deeds and not the people. Now I'm going to give you another idea about where people have a wrong understanding of the Bible. Now we turn to one of my absolute favorite books of the whole Bible, which is the book of Daniel, and chapter 9. And at the end of that chapter, we can read that also a lot of people make a wrong connection to the he. Huh? Now, it says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? The people of the prince that shall come. And mm -hmm. in verse 27 it continues and says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay. Who is the he? Daniel refers to in verse 27 after 
reading verse 26. Yeah, of course, it's the one which is referred to in the beginning of verse 26. So it's the Messiah. Messiah. It's, it's Messiah. Messiah. You are correct. Yeah. But in all the churches in the world, brother, uh, brother Brett and brother Michael, it is taught. <laughs> yes. It That's is right. taught that the he refers to the prince that shall come. This one. Mm hmm. Because this prince that shall come is historically be understood Titus, who is the son of the, at that time, reigning Roman emperor uh, Vespasian, if I'm not mistaken by that name now. But we are speaking about Titus and his soldiers, the people of the prince that shall come. That is Titus and the 10th legion of the Romans who came in 70 AD to destroy Jerusalem, to burn it down to the ground. And Jesus Christ even made the prediction and said that this temple will be destroyed and there will not be one stone left upon another. And what are all the Jews doing today in Jerusalem? They are going to wailing on a wall that they say is the last remaining wall of the temple. So they mm. again make Jesus Christ a liar because he said there will not be one stone left upon another. Surely not a whole wall. Yeah? Good point. Yeah. But this point, the prince that shall come, is not the one who shall confirm the covenant with many. And this is where the lie of futurism picks up. And the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope of this world or the Popes of this world deceive the whole world with a wrong interpretation of this. And this is why I think it is so very important, Michael, that you made this point. Well, Jesus Christ refers to the deeds because of the witch. And I don't mean witch with a T. Yeah? because of the witch, the deeds that he hates, not the Nicolaitans. And that's the same in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. The he in verse 27 that we see here can only refer to Messiah and cannot refer to the prince because it says the people of the prince. So then it would be they shall confirm the covenant with many. Huh? It just says the people of the prince that shall come. So he can only be related in verse 27 to verse 26, Messiah. Just a little point, absolute outside of this reading, but inside a very important Bible teaching that I want to make with you guys over here. Yeah? That Thank is you. very dear to my heart that we understand this correctly, because this is on the basis on the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It is because the Roman Catholic Church teaches this wrongly that so many people are not reading books like this one from Ernest L. Martin and do not understand that Peter never was in Rome, that Peter was not the first Pope and that the Pope is the Biblical, Historical and Prophetic Antichrist. And the basis for that is to be found in the wrong teaching of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, especially with the wrong reference of the he in verse 27 to the prince that shall come, and therefore putting that what Messiah accomplished 2000 years ago to the hands of the Antichrist who is in the future. The Roman Catholic Church teaches everything 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches. Daniel teaches what Messiah will do and the Roman Catholic Church with their futurist interpretation and teaching tells you that it is not Messiah we are talking about but the, that it is the Antichrist we are talking about and by that deception they deceive the whole world as God warned us already that he will send the people who do not believe in him a strong delusion. Yes, the two names Nicolaus and Balaam are exactly the same in meaning. Yeah? 
We are speaking of the Christianized religion of Nimrod. All of the heresies mentioned in the seven churches and in the book of Revelation in the first three chapters, we go through all the warning that Jesus Christ speaks out into the first seven churches, are of one system only, and that is the system of Nimrod, under the leadership of Simon Magus, the real first bishop of Rome. Any comments from any of you brothers there? No. No. Okay. Balaam represents Nimrod. The name of Balaam is another name for Nimrod. But understand this clearly. The Balaam who met Israel on their way out of Egypt was not the original Nimrod. He had been killed several hundred years before. This Balaam merely represented Nimrod as his, let me add this one word, apostolic successor. We are all aware that Joshua, being a successor of Moses, was looked on as sitting in Moses' seat. Even in Christ's time, the scribes and Pharisees sat in Moses' seat of authority, as we can read in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 4. So it was with Balaam. He maintained one of the proper names of Nimrod to signify that he was legit the legitimate successor of the arch rebel. And to emphasize his authority, Balaam could point to his headquarters as the Pithor or Peter of Mesopotamia. Therefore, the Moabites, in their hatred for Israel, called for the chief priest of the pagan world. They ignored the priesthood of their own national guards, going to the highest authority they knew. Josephus represents this false prophet as Balaam, who lived by the Euphrates and was the greatest of the prophets of that time. Balaam was the successor of Nimrod, the Pontifex Maximus of the pagan world. His headquarters was the Peter on the Euphrates, the St. Peters of Mesopotamia, the chief oracle of paganism, the chief oracle of S.U.N. sun worship. This is a shocking revelation if you have never heard it before, but one which stands the test of the Bible and ancient religious history. And most important of all, it stands the test of the Bible. There is nothing more important but to measure everything on the Word of God, on the Bible, and to understand that everything has to stand in the face of the Word of God. And this test stands of the Bible because it is written in the few parts that we read already in the book of uh, De uh, Deuteronomy, I think we read here, and Numbers, right? Just when we scroll a little bit up, we have read this here in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. And there we read about this Balaam and that absolutely stands the test of the Bible. Now, let's go to some other pictures here. Peter guards come to Rome. Now, they are going on a journey from Mesopotamia to Rome in Italy. It is well known history, the author continues to say, that in the earliest ages the center of civilization was in Asia and Mesopotamia. In later times political power passed to the Greeks and then to the Romans. It is also well recognized that the religions of Asia by Greek and Roman times had also passed to the West. By the first century the mystery religions of the Babylonians were centered primarily in Rome. By that time, Rome had become the chief city of the world. Early records mention this transference of pagan religion from Asia right to the city of Rome. The first century book by Virgil, the Aeneid, something you can read about also in books like Rulers of Evil, to remind you of earlier readings I did, and in imperial times became a type of Roman Bible. Yeah, it was the work of Virgil, the Aeneid, and it was the uh, Sibylline, uh, the, the Sibylline workings. I don't come to the 
correct name of that right now. Those were the foundation, uh, quote unquote, holy books of pagan Rome at that time, and especially the work of Virgil the Aeneid. It gives the story of one Aeneas who wandered away from Asia right after the Trojan War and settled in Italy. The main theme of the book concerns the so-called quote-unquote sacred task of Aeneas, bringing the pagan gods of Asia to Italy, more specifically to Rome. Virgil spares no words in glorifying Aeneas' journey. He shows how Aeneas brought the Roman organized religion with all the pagan gods and goddesses necessary for performing it. And most important, Virgil constantly says that these deities were the Petri of Asia. Now, let me just check. I think I have a picture here of Virgil's work. And I know that there is an uh, audio book on YouTube where this work is being read that will just ask at least 10 hours of your attention. <laughs> I have that in my watch later list and, wow. uh, on my channel, but I didn't care to do that because listening to an audio book, uh, probably even by, uh, oftentimes read by a computer voice, is something different than doing a book reading and discussion like we do over here. But this work from Virgil, the Aeneas, you have to understand what it's all about. Therefore, maybe you don't have to read it all, but at least read some kind of a summary or whatever, and get that this was the quote-unquote Bible of the pagan Roman Empire. Yeah? Now, these gods and goddesses, the author continues, were the Peter deities, the chief deities, which were destined to favor Rome and Italy above all other countries. Now, Asia had been the original home of the Peter gods. Through Virgil, we find them being transported to the doorstep of Rome. <laughs> and why not? By the first century, Rome was considered the home of the gods. Prudentius, an ancient Roman himself, says that there wasn't a single pagan deity that did not, in the end, find its headquarters at Rome. And you want to know where they had them? In the Pantheon. I don't know if I have a picture of the Pantheon. I think I do. And there in Rome they have this. Yeah, of course I have it. I have everything. <laughs> Good. No, no, not everything, but this one I have. So, here you can see the Everything pantheon. you need, brother. <laughs> yeah, everything I need. Yeah. Um, this is the Pantheon, of course, a nice obelisk in front of it. And what is the Pantheon? The Pantheon oh. is a temple of Jupiter. Yeah, look at the dome. Huh? Okay. Jew Peter, yeah. Jew Peter. J U Peter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should say J U Peter. J U Peter, yeah. The great dome in the sky. <laughs> oh, this is the ancient one, yeah, of course. In America now you have the modern version of that in Washington DC. Oh. And uh, just turn to the book Rulers so of true. Evil and American Graffiti so and true. these kind of uh, of chapters and you, you 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 make the circle round <laughs> all of a sudden. Wow. So here we have the Pantheon, and the Pantheon is the old pagan temple where in the niches all the pagan gods were put away. Statues of the, of the pagan gods. Then Rome baptized itself with Christianity. The Pantheon was given up and everything was moved into St. Peter's Basilica. Wait yeah. a second. This is ringing a bell here. Can I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Wasn't there some type of... A uh, statue of a deity or something outside the pantheon of, uh, boy, I want to say Jupiter. some kind of, well, no, before Jupiter. And they melted it down to make Jupiter. Well, that's that's possible, of course. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Jupiter I, is I, the Roman I Zeus. I, so maybe there was yeah. a, a statue of Zeus outside. And... There was some kind of statue. I don't know if it was inside or out, actually, but they melted it down 
and made Jupiter out of it. Yeah, and that Jupiter then they transported into St. Peter's Basilica and called yeah. it St. Peter, and that statue is still there. Exactly. We showed that yesterday in the broadcast. Incredible. When he was dressed in this uh, papal clothes, you know? I'm sorry, I don't have this specific reference in front of me. Um, if I find it, I'll mention it it's later. It's okay. You can, during the reading, maybe uh, look it up on the internet. Maybe you come back to us later and tell us. But the point that I want to make is this is the pagan temple of Rome, the Pantheon, where all the gods were kept as statues. And these statues then were uh, put elsewhere and they were all given Christian names. So all the quote-unquote holy uh, saints of the Roman Catholic Church are actually old pagan gods. And uh, this one picture that I so showed you before, uh, well, I, I, I even have another one here. Uh, I did that re doing the reading of uh, Babylon Mystery Religion. Uh, let's see, I think it is about minor gods and major gods. I just don't know which title I used. Um, no, not this one. Um, let's use the word gods. Maybe that's the way that I find it. Here it is. Major gods list. This is uh, a picture that uh, that is a, a page that you find uh, when you uh, do a little bit research uh, after, you know, regarding the book of uh, Babylon Mystery Religion of Ralph Woodrow. Um, I did a search on the major gods and the minor gods, and this is a page of the major gods. So you have the deity, which is called Apollo. The origin, of course, is in Greek, as the name is Apollo. Here you can see a description of it. Uh, also in Greek here you have Ceres, you have Diana, and you have Juno. And uh, Juno in Greek is called Hera, Diana in Greek is called Artemis, Ceres in Greek is called Demeter. And uh, Michael knows that very well because he lives in Germany and in Germany Demeter is a very big uh, company of organic food with very high standards. You know that one, mm. Michael? A bit, yeah. A little bit. Yeah, okay. So, me too. And Apollo, well, in the Greek still is Apollo. So, uh, what's my point? Well, you see here uh, the deities of a Roman and uh, the origin of it comes from the Greek. So, this is the original name. This is then the Roman name, yeah. The Greek Apollo became the uh, the same Apollo in Rome, but Demeter from Greece became Ceres, uh, Artemis became Diana, and Hera became Juno. And uh, they all became then in quote unquote Christianity, what uh, is uh, Roman Catholicism today. They all have been uh, have been given uh, biblical names, yeah. So, what you need to understand, and I think this is the point that must be made sometime, uh, the pagan Tammuz is what the Roman Catholics call Jesus. And the pagan Semiramis, they call Mary. And the pagan Nimrod, they call the Father. That is the Trinity. And the Trinity is a Babylonian, false, satanic teaching. Because in the Bible there is no Trinity. There is the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost and those three are one. But there is no ever spoken of a Trinity. If you think that you are so smart that you can explain to me the Godhead then try and do your best. But God does not explain the Godhead. He leaves that up as a thing to know when we probably gonna meet him. But he never speaks of a trinity. But the Roman Catholic trinity of Father, Son and Holy Ghost is Nimrod, Semiramis and Tammuz. And when you go into the Roman Catholic Church and you attend to a Mass and you receive the Eucharist, you don't receive Jesus Christ, you receive Tammuz, who is uh, sacrificed all over again. Whether you like it or not, but the truth is 
the truth. And this is the Pantheon in Rome, where all these pagan gods resided in the time that we are reading of here. Yeah. Well, Yerk, if you wouldn't mind to make a comment quick. No, about surely that. not. Why should um, I? I found that a uh, little bit of information here on a Google search, okay. and I've never you can heard send of it this via book Skype. Before. We can have a look at it if you want to. I've never heard of this book before, but very interestingly, I will send it to you here as soon as I get the link there. And uh, it looks like uh, page 46, Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Mm -hmm. and on Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Although this magnificent temple, the pride and wonder of ancient Rome, has disappeared, a catalogue of the Roman temples would hardly seem complete without some notice of its site. Is that what you wanted to share with us? Oh, there's all kinds of information in here. And actually, did you see this this paragraph here? It says, Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Yes, although the Magnificent Temple. Is that what yeah. you were reading, right? That was I was um, reading, yeah. Sure. So down, um, I mean, this is really interesting history. And the, the trouble with this is uh, there's so many details here. Um takes a little while to read through this and and uh, get all the pronunciations down but for me personally mm. but uh, it looks like um, this temple was struck in 64 BC when the celebrated bronze wolf was injured as described this is at the bottom of this page on mm -hmm. the first section yeah, I on see, the yeah. left and it then to the right by, it was struck by lightning in 64 when the yep. celebrated bronze wolf was injured, as described by Cicero. In the cell of Jupiter stood the statue of the god which is represented on metal still extent, in a sitting posture, with the foot extended. A well-known tradition states that Leo I, uh, that's um, probably Antichrist Pope Leo I, in the middle of the 5th century, melted down this statue to cast the bronze figure of St. Peter, but the tradition, though repeated by numerous writers, does not seem to rest on any recognized authority. Several quote-unquote fathers of the church, as St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose and others, mention the temple as existing in their time. And there are other authorities which notice it as late as the 8th century, from which period every trace of it uh, of its of it is lost yeah you know but there's a difference Brett of the temple of Jupiter that was in Rome that is this is speaking about and the Pantheon oh sure yeah Got so it. I was I was showing a picture of the Pantheon yeah that's uh, yeah. sorry <laughs> yeah, no 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 don't 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 say well, sorry we were I talking mean, about the Jupiter yesterday and I just thought this I, I can't remember where I read this but I read it somewhere and I just had to mention it yeah, you know, the Pantheon was one thing in Rome, that is still standing, but the Temple of Jupiter, that this article speaks about, that you were looking up by Rome and its environs, yeah. by John Murray, that speaks mm. of the Temple of Jupiter that does not exist anymore. And uh, we were speaking of the Pantheon, and that was the Temple oh. of the Gods, oh, yeah. you know? Well, maybe the Ju the new Temple of Jupiter is uh, Washington, D.C. No, don't the know. new Temple of Jupiter is St. Basil Peter's Basilica. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And that's a right. mirror that's of right. that, and the mirror of that, Brett, that is in Washington D.C. and that is right. the capital. The first and second piece. That's Absolutely, right. this is why yes. we have this book that's from Justin so Fulton, important. Rome, yes. uh, Washington in the lap of Rome. Yes, and then he also wrote another book called Rome in America, which is excellent. Probably, I, I don't know well. all the books. <laughs> oh yeah, you know. that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. But the point and, uh, is, this pantheon also is a Jupiter hmm. temple, as you can see by the dome that is here. Yeah, a J.U. Peter dome that yes. harbored all the pagan gods. And when then in 321 through Constantine, the pagan Roman Empire became the quote-unquote Christian Roman Empire. Yeah, Papal Rome, the beginning of that. Then all these pagan gods were taken out of there 
they were placed in St. Peter's Basilica that was still to be built, I mean the, the dome of St. Peter's, and they were just given Christian names, but taking the same figures, and they took out of this pantheon the statue of Jupiter, J.U. Peter, and put that in the basilica where it still mm. stands today. Mm -hmm. And that That's is that one, and that doesn't come from the Jupiter temple, which had been lost, as the author says here, probably correct. Mm -hmm. Needs uh, I, that's probably interesting to to read this book a little bit as long as you can read it on the internet like this, or even get a copy of it. Uh, right, maybe right. A, maybe, maybe we can find one. Maybe yeah. even a PDF. Uh, get right. this book in print. It says here, but you can also, uh, I think, uh, sure go somewhere down it. here to 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 archive.org or whatever exactly. and find that, that uh, as a PDF or whatever and have a look at it. Uh, it, it even speaks here about Castor and Pollux. Uh, you know, um, here you see that where my where my finger mm. is, Castor and uh, Pollux. Not yet. I'm on the other editor. I will be right with you. So when you look at the screen here, uh, it says here yep. it, it speaks about Got the it. temple of Castor and Pollux. Ah, Castor yes. and Pollux, where these two children that were fed by the wolf, you know, yes, those were right. in in in, oh. uh, in pagan Rome, uh, the founders know, know, of pagan Rome, but. Know, Sorry, but the Roman Catholic Church made of Castor and Pollux, Peter and Paul. You I know thought that? Romulus and Remus. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Romulus and Remus. Yeah, not Castor and Pollux. Yeah, okay. But anyway. Uh, with all these pagan gods you can hear that, it there. That's I got a little why, bit of going on. I mean, you know, this history is just incredible, isn't it? Uh, history is incredible, yeah. Fantastic to have. It is. It just it goes on problems? and on and on, and the Roman history is no small little thing. It's I gigantic. would like to add a comment here. Please. Um, you see, I'm just beginning to think that there is a special reason for this trinity, for this unchristian trinity, Roman Catholic trinity, because I was just looking up what the name Pantheon actually means. And it's, uh, it's a combination of two words, actually. The first one is pan, which stands for all, and tion for God. So the temple of, of all, all gods. gods. Yeah. And That's so right. that, that the Romans at the Mitras and, and, and many other pagan religions were used to have different gods for any purpose at all. For example, Diana was the goddess of the hunting and so on, etc., etc. They had a god for every day, as the Roman Catholics have a saint yeah, for every day. Same thing. A little G. Just a little G. Yeah. A whole yeah. bunch of little Gs. Yeah. Actually, actually, so they had to come up uh, with not one singular god, but with many gods. So they had at least to install a trinity. That's, in my humble opinion, the, the, yeah, the it, thing. It's called pantheism, brother Michael. Mm -hmm. That's right. The worship of many gods. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's the point. That's why the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, our Lord God is one God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's the big difference with the pagans. And that's the big difference with that deity. Uh, with, with that, sorry, uh, with that, um, with that trinity, because in that trinity, all three are gods: mother, father, and son. Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. You know, that's the point I wanted to make a little bit earlier. But mm -hmm. when we go into this, we go into a hour-long discussion on paganism and how it hijacked the real Christianity, and this is actually the reason why we are going to read this book anyway. To, yes, show, to show to the people how the Roman Catholic Church abused the real Christianity, the real apostolic biblical belief, to form it into something that also the pagans could believe. Because Rome needed to fill its churches. And therefore they needed all the heathen, all the pagans to come into their churches. That's why they changed the feast of Saturnalia into Christmas. Or 
the feast of Christmas into Saturnalia, whatever way you want to turn it around. They had the Saturnalia already, and they told the pagans, well, you come into our churches, you can still celebrate Saturnalia, we just give it another name, and you just celebrate this, the birth of the sun god, we just call him Jesus. Well, hey, of course, it is still Tammuz. Yeah. You know? Right. That's the policy of the Roman Catholic Church, and with that, they deceived the whole world. I mean, for almost 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Because the mystery of iniquity did already work in the time of Paul. 40, 45, 50, 55, 60 AD. When he was speaking to the Thessalonians, when he was speaking to all these different churches whom he wrote out of Rome. When he said to the Thessalonians, don't you remember that I told you when I was yet with you? Yeah? He was very clear when he was with them. He told them that the mystery of iniquity was already working. That mystery of iniquity goes back to Simon Peter, not uh, Simon Magus, not the Peter, the Apostle. The point that we are still trying to prove by reading this and have just been a little bit taken away into the study of old pagan Rome. but. Everything that we said is, is, is quite true and everybody can check that for himself and he can do, everybody can do his own research on that. And when I first heard about Virgil and the Aeneas, or the Aeneid, yeah, as it is also called, that was in the book of Rulers of Evil and I really dug into it and it's quite interesting that this guy who came from Troy went to Rome, I think even took his uh, father or something who was quite hurt to Rome, <laughs> And he took all the knowledge of the pagan, um, uh, of the pagan religion from Troy to Rome. Troy was uh, Greek, or under 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 Greece uh, uh, occupation, under Greek occupation because of the, you know, the Trojan horse. <laughs> <laughs> how the Greeks got into Troy, yeah, and I need I, I need traveled from Troy to Rome and brought this pagan religion to there. This is how Rome was founded, or at least what they use as their foundation of this last pagan. Um, empire that we have in the world. First Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and from Greece to Rome, via the help of Aeneid in his uh, in his work from Virgil, who just wrote this down, this work of Aeneid. Is Aeneid a real uh, historic person? I don't know. Is it just a legend? I don't know. But the work of Virgil, of the Aeneid, is one of the big foundations of the Roman Catholic Church still today. And therefore you need to inform yourself about this a little bit. Huh? Now when we speak of all these Peter deities, and we of course speak of J.U. Peter, Jupiter, it is important to understand that that um, statue first was in this pantheon in Rome. And when then Constantine hijacked Christianity and hid the pagan Roman Empire under the name of Christianity, all the gods that were put in this pantheon, as you say, it stands for Pan, uh, what was that, M uh, many many gods something, Michael, you said? All, all. All, all, all the gods they had, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and they took them out of here and they took them into their quote-unquote new church, what we call today St. Peter's Basilica, you know. And they left the Pantheon uh, alone. They didn't worship there anymore. They worshiped the same gods, they just built a new temple. And that's still St. Peter's Basilica today. With all its derivatives you have in the United States of America. And don't think that Washington is the only city with a capital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have more than Good forty point. states. You have more than forty <laughs> states in the United States of America who have a capital in their capital city. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. only Rome. So right. there are a lot of mirrors of that J.U. Peter Temple all over the world from Rome. 
But uh, let's see, where was I in this reading here? The chief deities which were destined to favor Rome and Italy above all other countries. Now let's just go and finish this few little sentences here and then we can next time continue with the chief guards of Rome. We will probably go into the same subject right now but by the writing of uh, Ernest Martin and not by my comments who here and there are a little bit off for that I'm sorry. Uh, of course it was uh, Remus and Romulus and not uh, Castor and uh, that other guy who I just mentioned there. Pollux. Pollux, Pollux. yeah I, I was a little bit off there. That can happen you know here and there you can get a little bit um, Disturbed Distracted. by all these oh, yeah. different names. Yerk knows that when I started to read the book, uh, um, The Secret History of the Jesuits, on my channel. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Little off. Little off, yeah. <laughs> oh, Therefore, it's always we'll good to have. Try again later, someday. <laughs> Therefore, it's always good to have somebody else on the call that can help exactly you out. Exactly, your. I'm very yeah. glad for Michael to point that uh, to point me to that mistake, and uh, that's why you Saves guys are us here for. a lot of trouble down yeah. the line. Yeah, exactly. So Asia had been the original home of the Peter Guards. Through Virgil, we find them being transported to the doorstep of Rome, and why not? By the first century, Rome was considered the home of the gods. Prudentius, an ancient Roman himself, says that there wasn't a single pagan deity that did not, in the end, fit its headquarters, find its headquarters in, at Rome. Notice what he says. Quote, from Symmachus' work, pages 189 to 197. There came to be one single home for all earth-born gods, <laughs> Earthborn gods, interesting uh, way of saying that. And you may count as many temples of gods at Rome as tombs of heroes in all the world. Unquote. It could hardly be any clearer. By imperial times, Rome became the headquarters of pagan religion. It was the chief oracle of the world, the Peter for the earth. And that ends our reading today of this book. And I want to turn for a final comment from to Brother Michael and after that to Brother Brett. Please, guys. Yes, thanks for the reading. It was very informative, very interesting. And I think it was uh, one of the most, for me, one of the most interesting because I could connect so many dots you see that the phrase all, lead, all roads lead to Rome I think can be extended to all pagan religions leads, leading to Babylon and that the Roman Catholic Church is just the Babylon in disguise and so as we discovered that the Pantheon uh, was always a uh, worship temple for the ancient gods and goddesses they had to make up some disguised Babylonian gods uh, to fulfill their, or not to fulfill, but to actually uh, mask their goals in terms of uh, using the Christian uh, Mary, the Jesus as a child. And uh, so I think all mixed up together with the Mitras religion, they came up with the Roman Catholic Church. And as I always uh, like to pronounce, it's just Catholic, it's just uh, universal. It's a meaning for universal, and so you can, it's, can uh, just uh, shorten it to the Roman Church. It's a, it's a Roman Church. And uh, as we know that Rome never changes, yeah, they, their religion has also never changed. And that's my closing comments. Their religion has never changed. They have just given their gods other names. Yeah. That's right. Brett? Yes, and I have one Bible verse. <laughs> okay. Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. And I think that ends the broadcast for my end. Yeah. Good one. And it's very good to end a broadcast like this with a Bible quote, with a Bible word. And um, as I discovered one of these days, another 
interesting Bible quote of Psalms, chapter of Psalm 118, verse 8. Always remember this when God says in his word, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Until next time, Maranatha.